start um, just real quick. I want to take a quick poll. Um, you can do this by raising your hand, and it works so much better if we all participate. Trust me, it just makes the room feel a lot uh, more cohesive. So, a uh, couple questions. Number one, if you are above the age of 40, raise your hand. It's okay, you 30, you 41, 42 year olds, just go down back into your 30s. You're more than happy to do that. I am not going to judge at all. Awesome. If you are under the age of 40, would you raise your hand? Awesome. Man, wow, look at that split. We got, we got such a crowd here. Oh, man, there's, there's something about gathering multi-generational just as a group of people who are chasing one thing. Uh, who is this God? Who is this God? So I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, who is, who's feeling good about life right now? Raise a hand. Who's just, who's just feeling good? Awesome, awesome. Who, who in here is just like, yeah, I'm a little discouraged right now? Who say they're discouraged in life right now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Hey, those hands go straight, not here. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, just up here. Yeah. Uh, anybody in this room, who's, who's angry or just frustrated right now? Anybody that, that kind of life? Yep, a couple people. Anybody in this room just really heartbroken? Anybody just not feeling good? Yeah? Anybody stressed? Anybody stressed? Yeah. Anybody stressed about relationship stuff? Well, okay, wait, time out, hold on here. We just had like 50 people raise their hand and then all of them went down. Okay, who stressed uh, financial stuff? Anybody stressed about finances in this room right now? You got some finance? Yeah, a few of us in here. Anyone just tired? Anybody just worn out? Anybody's candle wick just down to the last core? Yeah, absolutely. Anyone questioning God right now? Anybody in a spot just like, God, what are you doing? Anybody doubting him? Yeah, a couple of us. Now, I wanted to keep that, that pretty general, but there's this, there's this interesting thing about church that we're going to be talking about tonight. You see, what we just read, um, there, there's something, when we come into a space that's a church or, or a Christian, there's, there's something that we really tend to focus on, and it's this word called problems, right? How many of us in here might have actually come, and you don't have to raise your hand on this one, how many of us in here might have actually come to know Jesus because there was a problem that was fixed that just seemed like it couldn't get fixed before? Yeah, there's something about, there's something about life that when, when something arises that doesn't go according to where we're going, there's this issue. And we start to look for a whole bunch of different things, and one of the things that we might even get desperate to look for is this thing called Christianity or God or church. Now, I wanted to keep that general. We could, we could go as deep as we wanted in there. Statistically, somebody in here is really struggling marriage-wise. Statistically, somebody in here is, is struggling with some kind of substance, whether that be um, some kind of drug, some kind of uh, alcohol, some kind of just um, a material object. And there's something really interesting about problems that draws us to this guy, Jesus, you see, when we spend time and we start going down this rabbit hole of, of what is Christianity, what's the church, what's, what's, what's Jesus, everything, if you're, you're experienced and you've been following Jesus for any amount of time, you're starting to see that these external problems that happen in our lives actually start to be revealed that it's more internal stuff than it actually is external stuff. And we start to wrestle like, oh man, like... How am I reacting to some of these things that are going on around me and where do I find myself being pulled when things don't agree with my life and where I want to go? And so also, once you start spending time with Jesus, you start to realize that, that Jesus isn't actually this like problem fixer. Uh, he's, he's much deeper than that. He's, he's a complete life changer. He, you see, Jesus has the power to change the very fabric of somebody's soul. And all throughout history, from, day, from page one of the Bible, uh, through both biblical history and just recorded history, we see these things, these acts, these behaviors that people engage in that we would deem as, as evil. Like, just world. You ever ask yourself that question recently? Like, what is happening? Whether it's a news thing we asked or we watched, whether it's something that we heard our, our kid or our family members say, just like, where, where does that stuff come from? And so there's this idea that the, what we just read in Acts, that there's these, these group of behaviors that these people start engaging in that Luke's writing down about that, that isn't just like, hey, that's some stuff in the church. And sometimes if we've grown up in the church and we've been around Jesus a while, we read something like Acts and it's just like, oh yeah, that should be normal Christian behavior, right? Uh, but this is so much more monumental than that. 
Think about the last time you, just, you were so compelled by something that you sold your house and brought it to the pastor or the leader's feet and were just like, hey, I, I just need you to give this money to anybody who has need. When was the last time you did that? Or when was the last time that you truly went into a worship service or, or a church gathering and you were just so, so awestruck and so focused on where is God and, and, and just in that just deep relationship part? Or when, when was, was the last time you, you shared a meal with somebody other than just a close friend? When's the last time these things? So Luke's writing down these, these, these details that these people are, are doing, and, and it's not as much just simple behaviors. It's like, what is happening right now? Like, like some of the things that, that Luke's saying is that people, people are engaging one another. Like, well, not that engaging, but I mean, hey, I mean, what better place to meet that special someone than church? Am I right? Like, you never know. You never know. But no, people, people, are, people are getting together with each other. They're, they're eating together. They're all, they're all rushing and gathering at the temple and, and miracles and wonders in Jesus' name are being presented. Like crazy stuff is happening. We just said people are selling property and they're bringing anything they can to make sure that the last person in this community is without need. And we see that Luke says that no one, no one was without need. And just two sentences prior to that, we see that 3,000 people were just added to this community and many more to come and no one was without need. You see, Luke is talking about a, a community where there, there is no status hierarchy. There is no economic hierarchy. Every single person views themselves on the same level as everyone around them. Think about that. That's nuts. That's what Luke is trying to present here. What in the world is going on? And you see that what, was, what Luke describes as happening is the grace of God, the Holy Spirit. Something powerful is at work that is not just changing people's behaviors, but it's changing the very way people are, who they are, their core of their being. And so what we see is the Holy Spirit is the one who is organizing and bringing together what we know as this word called church. And so that's what I want to do tonight. I just want to talk real quick about the church, where we're at, some of the things that I feel that keep us from this spot of actually being with God and, and, and deep with God. Because I think there are some real issues that as a church we need to address right now up front if we're going to even think about continuing forward into this new direction. And then I want to share our vision and then I want to just uh, say a few quick things about that and then we'll be done. And then we'll be back to worshiping together again before we, hang out, uh, before we head out. So, good? Thumbs up? Everybody good? Just, I know, just hang with me here for the next few minutes. It's gonna, I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it. Not just because I was the one who was writing and processing what God was putting in my head. I'm telling you, just, it's going to be worth it. Um, if I ask this question, what is church? What, what are some of the things that start coming to your head? Because the first, the basic answer to that question is you're driving around Tate's Creek. Um, you might drive past Park. You head out a little farther and you see Centenary and then you see Emmanuel Baptist and you see Tate's Creek Christian. And it doesn't get long of driving around a, a street in Lexington to find four, five, six, or 12 different churches. And so immediately you would say, hey, that's, that's a church, Right? Like, that's a church right there. You might recognize sign. You might recognize architecture, whatever that might be. You might say, hey, that, that's my church. That's where I go. Now, if you've been in the church, you've been following Jesus for a little bit, that, there might be this, like, flag that's going up. It's like, mm, not really, other than just a building. And then you might give the answer of, yeah, no, the church is, it's a people. It's a people who believe, and, and maybe the Christian faith is, it's a people who believe in, in the Christian God or that Jesus is this, and so we follow these ways, we follow this code of conduct, that's what church, it's a group of people who believe in the same thing. But when we look at scripture, there's a deeper, way deeper, way more impactful thing. Because if we're going to be honest, just a group of people who believe the same thing and a, a place that like spiritual stuff happens, that's pretty surface level, if we're being honest. It's pretty shallow. Like how is that, is, how does that in, like captivate God, right? Like this is God of the universe, bigger than everything, created everything with just a word and, and a, a motion of his hand. And it's just a people who believe kind of the same stuff. You see, the Bible talks about this interesting point of where God's going with this whole thing. 
what is the, what's the end result of Revelation, right? What's the, what's the last chapter, last couple chapters look? It's this moment where God is bringing this physical world that he made and his space, the spiritual, the heavenly realm, bringing it into one space together. He's bringing heaven and earth together. That's God's end result. And he wants that space to be filled with every single person that he created here on earth. Now, if you know your Bible, we don't have to wait just for that time to come about fully. If, if you know your Bible, you actually would know that there is actually some spaces throughout the narrative, throughout the story, that that intersection between heaven and earth has already happened. First one being is, is the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is this space, this garden that's up on this hill that is, that is the converging point between heaven and earth, where heaven and earth finally meet each other and interact in the same spot. Fast forward a little bit. Another big point is, is the tabernacle in Exodus. God tells the Israelites, hey, I want you to create this tent, but this tent isn't just going to be a tent. This tent is going to be the place where heaven and earth, where I come down and you guys come around, and we're all in this one spot together. So we see the tabernacle being this, this intersecting point between two realms in this universe. And then we fast forward, and that tabernacle becomes a giant structure called the temple and God fills that temple with himself, and then something crazy happens. We get to the Gospels, and the temple starts to become the, the least of the focus there, and this guy shows up on the scene who says, hey, this new converging point of heaven and earth is me. And we see in the Gospels, Jesus is this, this breaking point, this intersection between the two realms in this universe, and then Jesus leaves, and then it's like, wait, what? Aren't you like the guy who connects everything? Like, what's going on? And then you read the rest of the New Testament, and what do we find? Where does this point of heaven and earth actually intersect going forward? In the everyday, ordinary, sinful people of the world. Ain't that crazy? That God says, hey, what I have done throughout history of bringing two realms. I mean, we are talking like beyond like metaphysics and things like that. We're talking like insane amount of universal like thought into one thing. And he decides that the best place that that is going to happen is in people who at one point had wanted nothing to do with God. Ain't that insane? Now tell me that doesn't give a better picture of, of church. And so we see that the Christian, you, if you've chosen to believe in Jesus, the church is you. It's a group of people, both individual and collective, not just who believe in the same thing, but who have been marked and now hold the very intersection, the convergent of two universal realms in one chest area, I guess. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? Like, how are we all just not like jaw drop, like what? Right? That's church. That's real church. And you'll see throughout history, you don't even have to be in the Bible to see this, but it's very present in the Bible, that there are these moments where people realize that and crazy things happen and there's this relational side to God and people and they're like, yes, we're doing this together. And it's not just two people, it's two realms connecting in some point. But then people start to turn and go back into this point of saying, hey, I'm good, everything I see around me I think we'll just stay here. And Israelites do it. The church has done it so many times of these waves throughout history of people coming to know God and God doing amazing things and reminding them who you are as his. But then people drift away. And so the reason this exists, the reason that Park Campus is here and we're starting this community is because we believe that we're in one of these moments that the church has been drifting for a long time now, in America at least, and all across the world. And that God is calling us back into some stuff. And so I want to just share two things that I think going forward that we have to know as the church in order to break free from these things, to separate what is earthly, what is culture, and what is God so that we can move back into this space of God. And the first one is this. It's called consumer culture. 
consumer culture. Now, let me show you how I know that you have been affected by consumer culture. And you can actually, let's actually all say this out loud together. So fill in the blank here, ready? The customer is always... Exactly. See, you've been affected. Oh my gosh, there's no hope for any of us. The customer is always right. Man, how amazing is that? The customer, I'm always right. I get what I want no matter what you say. And how many of us are on the receiving end of that when the customer is definitely not right and we have to just grin and bear it, right? That's consumer culture. You see, America's beautiful at this, and this has gone on long before America was around, but America capitalizes off of this. This is what you want. This is what to make your life better. You need to be in this spot, so come. Come, here's some enticing stuff. Come buy it into this stuff because it's going to make your life so great. What are we on, the iPhone 18 now, 14? Like, what? And we're all going to lose our minds when the 15 comes out. Like, that's just how it operates. That's just, that's, and we're all affected by it. See, the consumer culture has just filled all of us to think about it is all about you. And who is the master of your world? You. So you get what you want. And then we get to the church where it's all about God and it's all about other people. And then we're like, mm, I don't really like that. And then we're in this struggle of like, how do, I, how do I get rid of myself but still follow God? But unfortunately, that culture is, has started to seep, and it's not started, it's, it's heavy into the church. Let's talk about music preference, right? And I'm not saying that's a wrong thing, but man, I have witnessed wars happen. Hymns are contemporary. I've, I've heard one called satanic. That's how deep this is. Why? Because that's not how I like to worship. Let's talk about music quality. I, I, didn't re I didn't really enjoy worship this morning because it just didn't sound, it didn't sound that great, so I, I wasn't really able to worship. You know, I have witnessed, in my years in ministry, I have witnessed people tell pastors, you can't speak on that because that sin or that stuff, it's inappropriate to share in front of large groups of people. But what is it really? It's just us not wanting to deal with the realness of what's actually going on here. I've seen people wage war against leaders because that's not okay to talk about what's in the Bible. Why? Because church is about me. When's the last time we walked into a worship service with no agenda? I, I don't know the last time I did it. I mean, seriously. But here's the thing. It's, it's in all of us. It's in all of us. And I've been feeling God pull me into this spot of what, is, what have you been taught by culture and what is actually me? Because the faith that we serve, uh, the faith that we live and, and the God that we serve, he, he is a jealous God and he says it is about me. It's all about me. You know, I created you. You, you didn't spawn yourself into being. I created you. And sometimes we're like, I have the audacity to tell, my, to tell God I'm better and I know more. Isn't that funny? We, we, couldn't even, we couldn't even bring ourselves into existence, and yet we can, you know, do our lives without him. So consumer culture, that's one thing that's going to that's gonna take spirituality away. The second is this, mask culture. Mask culture. Man, uh, I, and again, this is another one of those things that it's been around a long, long, long time. People just getting into this thing of, of wearing this mask and being somebody else around other people. And America has, has gladly just thrown this. I mean, let's talk about the workplace, right? Let's talk about corporate America. You've got to be your best all the time. Isn't that crazy? Like, we actually go into jobs thinking, I have to be my best all the time. Job, uh, job uh, interviews, right? Resume builders. What do I have to do in my life to make myself above everybody else in this room? How, if we think about it, how toxic actually is that? Like, we're going in trying to get a job, and then all of a sudden it's just like, wait a second, I've got to make sure that I'm the best person in this room. And then we start, like, not even viewing people as people. Let's talk about education, right? Get the grades. We're based on, on how well we're doing on these tests. And we're, we're told over and over again from early children that we have to perform. And in order to perform, we have to get that job. Because if we don't perform and get that job, man, we're going nowhere in life. 
And what does that do? It just puts on this thing that I cannot be myself around anybody because the second that I'm showing myself, man, there goes my, all my strengths that I listed. And let's be honest, all of our strengths on our resume, like caring too much is not a strength. Like just take it off. Come on. Like just take it off. We need to. No, but seriously, mask culture. And unfortunately, that's pulled its, its way into the church as well. The faith that we follow is based on this guy saying that you don't have to be anything but you because I love you. No strings attached, no resume needed, no performing at all. I want you to be in my family because you're you and I created you. Man, we follow a faith that is free from all that, but yet every single week we show up into small groups and Sunday schools, and man, it is just, I cannot let people know because then that goes into weakness. And I cannot let people know my inadequacies because I have to be performing at the level that God wants me to when God never asked you to do that. There's no freedom in the church these days because we've, and and shame on us as the church for allowing consumer culture and mass culture to just take root that we can't even look another person in the eyes and say, man, I am not having a good day because I'm fighting at home or I just lost my job and all this is happening. Can you pray for me? No, we, we even see us asking someone for prayer is weakness. Going to God with our life is weak. When did that happen? Mass culture. It's going to take God out of things immediately. And so if these are the two things, and this is, this is not real church, then we've got to separate those two, and we've got to walk into something different. So where are we going? If that's where we're at, then obviously we need to get out of that because that's not a fun place to be in. We need to be somewhere else. Where are we going? Where's Park Campus going? I'm glad you asked. Look on the screen right here. Obviously, I know that you can't read this because I know we've got people with eye problems up in the balcony in the back. So don't worry. I made better slides for it when I do actually read it. But this is our Park 23 vision. Also, it's hanging up in the back of our, our uh, foyer back here. So every time you walk in, you'll be like, what's our park vision? Oh, it's back there. I'm just going to go look at it now. Um, so let's walk through this together. A couple of things I want to point out is number... Oh, back up real quick, Chris. Thank you. Um, first thing I want to point out, 2030. That's interesting. Are we saying that park isn't going to exist past 2030? Absolutely not. No, one of the things that we were thinking about in our team was just like, man, what does it look like to, to have a vision, but also to be moving somewhere that we can see? And so we felt like, man, what, what would it look like if, if, we've got a, if this is work ahead of us and we've got a lot of things to get into and to let God dig into, man, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a timeline to where like, hey God, what would we see by this time? And we said, man, 2030 is coming up in seven years. What does it look like to be kind of on this mission in a, in a very timeline based and just, we have, we have something. There's this sense of urgency. There's, there's this call to, to move. So by 2030, we hope to see this. And so this, this vision statement is written, hey, in 2030, Park Campus will look like this. So now let's go through it. Curtis, thank you says this, in 2030, Park Campus is this, we are a welcoming family, inviting anyone into following Jesus with us. As spirit-filled followers, we live rooted in the truth of the scriptures and wholly dependent on God. We are a community committed to fulfilling the mission of Jesus by sharing our time, our energy, and our life with others to make disciples for the kingdom. Through God's grace, we see baptisms, life change, and we have reached over 7,000 people for the gospel. In our neighborhoods and to the nations, we are a people who walk through life together, pray deeply for each other, and humbly serve one another. Every single day, We are participating in a story bigger than our own lives to advance the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, normally in a business setting, you would have a lot of goals and a lot of things that we want to accomplish by this date. 
you will only find just a few of those in there, which is very, very intentional. You see, our lead team, man, for months, we, we have come up with this, and we've picked apart, I mean, we have, we've analyzed a lot of those different words in that vision statement. Why does this word work here, and why does this? And then we were thinking, it's like, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? Where, like, where are we going? And then, and then it was just like, wait a second, aren't, aren't, we, aren't we speaking and preaching against what are we doing? Aren't we speaking against performance? Aren't we, like, what, what would it look like if we were a church that focused so much more on being than it did doing? Now, I think in a successful group, in a successful community, as we're walking in a direction, we have to have some kinds of things. Because if we just have qualitative stuff, then, then we don't really have anything to see visually other than just stuff that's happening behind the scene and over time. And so we added in things like we want to see baptisms. I would hope that we would have a number just to be like, hey, I'd love to, I mean, honestly, me personally, I'd love to see us baptize 100 people here a year. But I'd love to see them, and I'd love at the end of 2030 to look back and see, man, how did God work? Or I'd love to see life change. I'd love to hear the stories and be able to have lists and videos of stories of people, how this community changed their life as they met God and were around people who loved and care about them. And then we have something on there that's, that we want to reach 7,000 people by the end of 2030. Like, what would it be like if we, if how, like, how many people do we interact with? How many people do we have around our, our, our church? Like, if we all invested in just a few people, man, we could reach a thousand people a year. We could, we could let a few people in our lives know about the gospel so that the gospel, so we have these quantitative measurements because we want this sense of urgency. We don't even know if we're promised tomorrow, but man, would we love to see what God could do if we really stepped into that? But then you'll see the rest of our vision is just attributes, right? It's just adjectives. It's characteristics in a couple verbs. We're a welcoming family. We invite people in. We're more focused on God because we're wholly dependent on the Spirit. We, we stay in the Scripture, we're fulfilling the mission of Jesus because we're giving up our time and our energy and our life. We're, we're people who care, or in other words, we're people who are all in. Little sermon series for uh, those of you who are paying attention. That's the sermon series we're in. It just came to my mind, and I was like, pair those two things together. What if we were a church that was focused way more on being than it was doing, how it should have been in the first place? So, how do we fulfill that vision? There's three things that centenary values as a church over everything, and it's amazing to see how God interwove those things. There's three things. We gotta stay rooted in the word, we gotta be renewed by the spirit, and we gotta reach out to the world. And I wanna touch on these three things very quickly, and then I'll be done and I'll shut up, I promise. First thing, rooted in the word. We believe and we will believe always that the Bible is objective truth. It is the truth. There is no other truth about what life is supposed to be, what the world is supposed to be, that will come against that in our heads, in our hearts. The Bible is the ultimate authority of truth, and we will believe that till we are all gone. We will believe that there is a God who is very real, who created all of us by himself. We will believe that humanity is trapped in this thing called sin, and it's the reason for all evil in both humans and the world alike. We will believe that Jesus is actually God, and that what he did in his death freed us spiritually to live a brand new life, and we will believe the craziness that Jesus rose himself after being killed and now lives through the very thing that gives him and God life will now live in each person who chooses and claims to believe in him. We will stake our lives on that truth. We will be rooted in the scriptures and each week we're gonna come in this room and future we hope to have groups and we hope to have little places where you can connect individually, where you can go through the scriptures and learn as well. But there's something interesting here that we were talking about of like, okay, what is one thing that I think in a worship service that just needs a little bit more refreshment and explaining? And I think it's this thing that we call the sermon. Right? The sermon, unfortunately, has just become a thing. It kind of has. How many of us can remember more than one thing about what we heard in the sermon last week? 
yeah, maybe, maybe a couple. If you were paying attention or taking notes, that's awesome. Proud of you. Just know that every pastor gives you points for taking notes. You should do it more for uh, just the sake of it. Um, but we are going to, we're going to meet in this room. Each week we're going to meet in this room and we're going to dig open that Bible and we're going to jump into teaching each other. And I'm going to encourage us. I'm going to challenge us. What does it look like to start moving from this passive observer to this active participant in what God might be saying through the person on stage, through you as you hear things. I'm going to encourage us, hey, what does it look like to bring a notebook, to bring something each week? There's a reason that God said, hey, these crazy events that are happening, write those things down because people 4,000 years later, they're going to need that badly and they're going to need to know what I'm doing. How in the world are we going to know what God is doing in our lives two months from now if we're not documenting it? And so I'm going to challenge and I'm going to encourage and you're going to hear me say a lot, hey, what are you doing to remember what God's doing with you here on this date of March 5th or 12th and so on? And we're going to teach and we're going to learn and we're going to figure out how to fall in love and know more about what this Bible, what this word of life, this objective truth actually means for our life. So we're going to stay committed and rooted in the word. Second is we are going to be renewed by the Spirit Our vision says statements like we're welcoming and inviting to anyone. How often is it very easy to do that? Some of you might be very easy. Others, sometimes like me, is not that super easy. We're inviting and welcoming to anyone. Anyone. Think about that. Anyone. We're giving our time and our energy and our life We're giving up precious time that we all don't have to do this Jesus thing. What? We're making disciples. We're investing in people's lives. We're walking through life with people. We're going to pray deeply for another. Heck, heck, uh, some of us won't even pray out loud by ourselves. And we're going to pray deeply for each other? We're going to live a life of humility? We're going to actually take this call of Jesus of being last seriously? What? We're going to bring heaven here to earth. You see, none of this can be accomplished because all of those are godly things. We didn't just pull this park vision and said, what are some cool things that would make people feel welcome? No, we pulled these things from the Bible. What is the character of God? What is the character of Jesus like? What do we see Jesus doing? But the only thing that sets that apart from just being good Christian boys and girls is that all those are heavenly things. And we can't do those things if we don't have heaven going on inside here. And even more so, we can't do any of those things if we're not even paying attention to heaven going on inside here. We have to live daily renewed by the Spirit. If we're claiming, if the disciples are claiming that, hey, the people who believe in Jesus, they're like Jesus when he came out of the grave. You're not just a Christian because you believe in this. You're not just a Christian because you go to church and do Christian things. What Jesus and the disciples are going to say is, you're a Christian by one thing and one thing only, the mark of the Spirit of God within you. That's the only thing God ever looks for. That's the only thing God will ever validate you on, is the Spirit, the thing that gives him power and life is now tethered and marking you. you I, heard it, I heard it once. You, you are not born, nor can you ever work to, into being a Christian. You are simply a Christian because God himself has marked you with his own spirit, with his own love. We have to live into that. And the only way we can is through him. And so each day we have to be renewed. And so finally, we're gonna reach out to the world. And that's the classic church motto, right? Let's go grow, Let's go build something. Let's go bring people and welcome in. And God does want his church to grow. He wants more. He wants the entire world. He wants every human that's ever been and ever to come into existence to be with him at the end of time. And we can, man, I want us to get fired up about that. I want us to see with heaven's eyes lost and broken people around us so that we might give them the same message and the same love and the same attention and the same care that we were given. Now, here's the interesting part. What we always end up hoping for is we think that, hey, God is just going to jump out of this curtain that the people were praying for and be like, hey, I'm God, believe in me. And we're all like, whoa, 
That rarely happens, like rarely happens. Show of hands real quick. How many of you are Christians because somebody took the time to invest and tell you about Jesus? Yeah, that's more like Christianity. That's the church we want to be. People who can go and do the same things that people sowed in us to see and love people the way that God does, to be renewed by the Spirit, to see what he does, and then go after them. But, but there's another aspect to reaching the world and, and growth standpoints. If you want to go to the gym and get just jacked, and you're like, I'm getting in shape, we're doing this. By the way, it's March. If you're doing that for your New Year's resolution, don't give up if you already have. Keep going. Um, but if you want to go to the gym and just get in shape and you never go to the gym, guess what's not going to happen? You're not going to get in shape. If you want to start a business and you never make that first effort or get that money together or get that, that plan together, guess what's not going to happen? Man, you are not going to have that business. If you want to be everything that Jesus says that you can be and everything he's calling you to be and this life that he's asking and welcoming you into and we never move into that, guess what you're not gonna be? Somebody that Jesus is calling and changing and molding and that's the thing, man. If you just sit, God will let you sit. But you see, reaching out to the world Doing the things of Jesus is not about fulfilling God's quota. Doing the things of Jesus is about changing you. It's about letting the Spirit work in you so that you might care about people more. You might welcome anyone. You might pray for somebody God might be putting on your heart. And that's what we want to see. I want to see this place grow. I want to see more people come to know Jesus. But you know what I want to see even more? Every single one of us in here grow spiritually to, a, to, the, to another level that we weren't able to be at before. I want to see us walk into these giftings and these talents that God is putting on our hearts of prayer or service or encouragement. I want to see us grow as Christ followers before we grow as a group of followers. And so those are the three things that we have and we will and I and leadership and our team and those of us who, have, uh, who want to take that next step into really helping and planting here, that's what we're going to be about. We're going to stay rooted in all of those things because that's real church. That's saying anything that I have, God, I believe that you're better and man, watch God do what he's going to do. And so how, how I want to end this, um, I want to invite the band back up real quick. Um, and so uh, usually with a launch, um, and, and this is kind of too, uh, more of a business thing too. It's like when you have a launch of something, you kind of want all the pieces in play. And then it's like, come and see this awesome new thing. And that's just not the case right here. Sure, we added some lights and uh, we changed our service time and stuff like that. But man, this plane is in the air. And it is still very unfinished. And so I don't have really much to, to say, hey, come and look at all this cool new things in this community. I have more of an invitation. And our team talked about this, and, and it was kind of revealed to us, what if the launch was not necessarily come look at all this shiny new stuff that we have, but more so an invitation? Do you need something new? Do you need something fresh? Do you feel like God might be putting you into a place in Centenary that is just, it's unknown, it's scary, but there's something tugging in your heart even after tonight that's like, hey, God might be doing something different with me and this might be it. The invitation is, would you come and help this community get to that vision? Would you help this new Centenary, this new part of Centenary, help, help shape this culture and then as we see this grow and as Centenary and Park, uh, as 2800 and Park start to, start to be merged and this, this family and these relationships start, start be, having even more form than they are now, man, the culture that God can start right here, man, it can translate to everything. And so that's, that's the last piece is where are you? Do you need something new? Do you need something fresh? Because this is the place for you, and I believe, man, if, if that's not, then pray over what's going to happen here. Because we are going to go, and man, we are going to bring people who don't know Jesus, and I believe it. If you were at the prayer conference and you heard Miriam's prayer, uh, man, she spoke that over us. There's going to be people who know Jesus here. But in order for the church, 
the people who where heaven and earth intersect with each other, the place where we can get rid of consumer and mask and all that, the way that we can get into this act culture where nobody views ourselves as better than other else is that we have to have people around. And so if that is you, um, I would ask that you pray and that you would ask God, is this where I need to invest? And, and is this what you might be doing in me? So I'm going to pray over us. We're going to sing together one last song, and then I'll bless us, and then we're out of here tonight. Amen.